Thank you for your interest in our virtual session entitled See You at Lilies, a focus on LGBTQ plus cultural heritage documentation. I am Cynthia Lachase Torres, and I am the manager of Arlington County, Virginia's Historic Preservation Program. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm Katie Hummel, an architectural historian with Fire Blender Bell Architects and Planners based in Washington, DC. My pro pronouns are also she and her. Our presentation will highlight our collaboration on a, do, on a new documentation effort to study LGBTQ plus heritage in Arlington County, Virginia. We'll be discussing the life of gay rights pioneer and activist, Dr. Lily Vincennes, who moved to Arlington in 1969 and hosted a weekly gay women's open house at her residence here in the county. During our research, we came across a poem from April 1976 written by Mary Ann Daly. It is called Lily's Commercial, and we wanted to read an excerpt to you to give you a sense of the community that Lily fostered at her home. You can come early, you can come late, you can come sober, but don't come straight, because even Noah Webster knew that gay means good. And if you've never been to Lily's, I reckon you should. Carlin Springs to 8th place, I'm feeling all right, at Lily's Open House on a Wednesday night. Before explaining our research, I first want to outline some learning objectives. Through our session, you will be able to one, discover some of the research resources that can help identify significant LGBTQ plus properties, both in Virginia and nationally. Two, explore the history of the homophile movement and the development of a lesbian social community here in Northern Virginia through the life and activism of Dr. Lily Vincennes. Three, identify criteria under which properties associated with LGBTQ plus heritage could be eligible for the National Register. And four, understand relevant preservation issues, such as how to assess existing historic sites through the lens of LGBTQ plus heritage, how to consider sensitive public outreach strategies and ideas about historic interpretation possibilities. We hope to inspire other groups and localities to consider similar documentation projects. We also will share some of our lessons learned towards the end of our presentation. I'll start with a quick historical overview of Arlington County in case you are not familiar with it. Arlington is the smallest self-governing county in the United States, and it is among the most densely populated. It has an estimated population of more than 238,000 residents within just 26 square miles. Arlington is the closest locality in Virginia to the nation's capital and historically was known as Alexandria County of the District of Columbia until it was renamed Arlington in 1920. Much of Arlington's history is 20th century history. This fact really helps define both the architectural fabric and cultural heritage that we celebrate today. Arlington's built environment was shaped by its transformation from a rural agricultural area to a bustling commuter suburb with distinctly urban neighborhood villages clustered along its main transportation routes. From the 1920s to the 1950s, Arlington experienced a population boom spurred by the rapid expansion of the federal workforce in the nation's capital. There was a critical need for affordable, plentiful housing for government workers. With the creation of the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA, in 1934, various programs helped finance military housing and homes for returning veterans and their families after World War II. Arlington's proximity to Washington, D.C., and the planners and designers at the FHA allowed the county to become a testing ground for these new planning ideas and architectural prototypes. Thus, the garden apartment as a building type was born here in Arlington, first with Colonial Village, a garden apartment complex built in 1934, and then followed by other examples such as Buckingham, Courthouse Manor, and dozens of others. In fact, by the mid 20th century, Arlington boasted about 174 garden apartments and complexes. Pictured here is Maywood, which is an early 20th century streetcar suburb of single family homes that is both a protected local historic district in Arlington and listed in the National Register. Also pictured is the Barcroft Apartments, a quintessential example of one of Arlington's largest garden apartment complexes that dates to the 1940s and 50s. 
But Arlington County is defined by more than just its garden apartments and its architecture. Due to our location in the county's Department of Community Planning, Housing and Development, the preservation program is an active participant in many of Arlington's major planning initiatives countywide. In our work, we serve not only as advocates for historic resources, but we also identify and research both people and places. We educate the public about local history and cultural heritage, as well as help manage changes in historic areas with the county's appointed Historic Preservation Commission. Currently, our program helps steward 41 local historic districts, 73 listings in the National Register, which equates to more than 12,000 contributing historic buildings, 12 preservation easements, and more than 100 historic markers. Our preservation program is always seeking to diversify our listings and ensure that our preserved cultural landscape is equitable and representative of the various communities found throughout Arlington. There are several protected historic properties associated with historic African-American history, for example, including Dorothy Ham Middle School, pictured here, and originally known as Stratford Junior High School. This building has local, state, and national significance as the first public school in the Commonwealth of Virginia to desegregate on February 2nd, 1959. But despite the variety of historic resources that our program helps oversee, to date, none of them are designated for their cultural value to local LGBTQ plus history. As briefly mentioned earlier, these designated and or protected historic resources do not yet fully represent Arlington's breadth of cultural identity and diversity, despite the county's rep reputation for being, an for being an inclusive, trailblazing and forward thinking community. To highlight this point, as of 2019, 54,000 Arlingtonians were foreign born and about 30% of households in Arlington speak a language other than English at their home. Arlington's public school system includes students from 146 different countries with the most common country, countries of origin, including El Salvador, Guatemala, Ethiopia, Honduras, and Mongolia with 107 different home languages spoken. To help celebrate this diversity, over the past decade, our preservation program has been making great strides to broaden our programmatic scope to emphasize a more inclusive sense of community identity, as well as the importance of cultural heritage to understanding Arlington's story. We began by prioritizing cultural heritage projects, especially pertaining to both local African American and Vietnamese history. Most recently, we have expanded those documentation efforts to include LGBTQ plus heritage. And by, by prioritizing these efforts, we are dedicated to telling a more inclusive narrative of our collective past, while also providing an important act of repatriation to a community that has experienced disregard, slander, erasure, or worse. And the National Park Service's publication, LGBTQ America, a theme study of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer history, Susan Ferentinos writes that studying cultural outsiders not only reveals insight into their experiences, but also sheds light on the experiences of the mainstream and what behaviors are and are not considered normative in a particular historical era. And according to the Williams Institute's LGBT demographic data estimates, there are 250,000, excuse me, 257,000 LGBT individuals in Virginia alone as of 2020, which is approximately 3.9% of the state's population. So how can we help ensure that the stories of these individuals are told? To work towards our goal of highlighting the stories of the LGBT plus community in Arlington, our staff began to identify potential sites in the county that merited future research, relying on information already collected by the State Historic Preservation Office, which in Virginia is the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, or DHR. We chose to collaborate with DHR on our documentation efforts, given the Commonwealth's ongoing LGBTQ heritage initiative statewide. In summary, the goals of DHR's LGBTQ Heritage Initiative include engaging scholars, preservationists, and community members 
to identify, research, and tell the stories of LGBTQ-associated properties. They encourage local governments, tribes, national parks, heritage areas, and other organizations to interpret their LGBTQ stories. They are working to identify and document LGBTQ-associated historic sites, and they would like to increase the number of Virginia listings of LGBTQ-associated properties in the National Register of Historic Places. To date, DHR's work has been very broad and thematic, and the state has been relying on individual localities to undertake detailed research and documentation. Just a handful of jurisdictions in Virginia, including Richmond, Roanoke and the Tidewater region have begun to research their LGBTQ plus heritage. The fact that research had not yet gotten underway in Northern Virginia presented an opportunity. DHR has been incredibly supportive of our documentation work here in Arlington, and we look forward to continued collaboration with them to eventually honor Arlington sites in both the Virginia Landmarks Register and the National Register. In November, 2021, our preservation team partnered with Arlington Video Group within the county government to produce a brief video featuring Freddy's Beach Bar and Restaurant. Freddy's, which is located in the heart of the Crystal City neighborhood near Reagan National Airport and the new Amazon headquarters, is a focal point of Arlington's LGBTQ plus legacy. To give you a sense of the importance of this story to our local and regional history, we wanted to share that video with you now. When people hear the phrase historic preservation, they likely think that it only involves old buildings. Historically, this has been true for the preservation field overall. For decades, nationwide efforts have mostly centered on preserving older buildings and preserving a primarily non-inclusive narrative. But what about the preservation of less tangible cultural resources, like stories, traditions, and community spaces? What about the buildings that are important for their ties to the community rather than for their architectural merit? That's why we're here today at Freddy's Beach Bar and Restaurant, one of the legacy businesses of Arlington and the only LGBTQIA plus and straight friendly bar in the county. Freddy's is an integral part of the cultural heritage of Arlington. Join us to learn more about why preserving and recognizing spaces like Freddy's matters. I always say it's not done till it's overdone. And if you come in here at Christmas, it looks like Santa Claus threw up in here. We probably have the most diverse clientele of any bar I've ever seen in my life. I mean, old, young, black, green, transgender, lesbians, gay boys, uh, straight people, kids, uh, it's really quite amazing. And because of our proximity to the Pentagon, we have a very large gay military clientele. Certain restaurants build themselves as gay friendly, so I decided to bill us as straight friendly. And some of my business cards say the only straight friendly LGBTQ bar in Northern Virginia, so I think it's, it's nice that straight folks feel comfortable in here, too. I think there's something about my art background and the gay world colliding that just blew up in here. The Barbies, one interviewer asked me about, and I said, I've been collecting them since I was a little girl and he put that in the article, which I thought was hilarious. It's not really a Barbie, but my absolute favorite is Gay Bob. Gay Bob comes in a closet, so when you open him up, he comes out of the closet. It's pretty awesome. Adam Sasso, I think, spent eight months with the company getting that doll made to absolute perfection. The doll even talks. It does the opening number for the drag show, which I do usually on Saturday nights in here.
Sean was in charge of the largest battalion in the country at Fort Myer, and his spouse, Adam, was a physician with the Honor Guard. They were the first same-sex couple to lay a wreath at Arlington Cemetery, and Johnny and I got to witness that. Eric Fanning, former Army Secretary under Obama, Kristen Beck, she's a former Navy SEAL that transgendered. Amanda Simpson, first ever transgender presidential appointee in history. Obama appointed Amanda to the Commerce Department. Gordon Tanner, former chief counsel for the Air Force. All those people come in here. On the occasion of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, we were packed in here. I, they passed around two cocktail napkins and there must have been 30 signatures on there of former, former generals, most of them women, that were gay, but they weren't allowed to admit it. So as somewhere I had those napkins saved. So that's the kind of uh, military presence we have here. I didn't realize it was gonna be as big a deal as it really is. I mean, we're totally respected by uh, pretty much everybody, the police, the fire, the county, the state. The governor flew a flag over us to commemorate our 20 year anniversary this year and presented me with a proclamation. Amazon, who seems to love Freddy's, reached out to me and they said, we love Freddy's and we'd like, this was during COVID, we'd like to uh, partner up with you to serve 10,000 meals to the first responders, which we did with the help of some of the local restaurants on the street. I, ha I was here at a Sunday brunch and uh, this one for some reason always sticks out in my mind. There was a family with uh, a five with three little red-headed kids and they were just adorable. And the dad said to me, the little one said, I want to go to the rainbow place. See that uh, flag in that rainbow, the box with the rainbow stars? So Tammy Smith, first ever out Brigadier General in the Army, presented that to me on the stage here. And she flew that flag on the occasion of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell over Baram Airfield. Uh, in my honor for providing a safe place for the folks from, <laughs> from the Pentagon to hang out at. And when I stepped off the stage, this boy came up to me, very attractive boy. And he said, you know, I met my partner here. Thank you so much. And, It's uh, the three little red-headed kids and that, that mean a lot. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you learned something new about the importance of cultural heritage and how it helps tell a more inclusive story of Arlington's history and character. In addition to Freddy's, there are many other examples of restaurants throughout Arlington that contribute to the cultural heritage and the diversity of the county. Many can be found along Columbia Pike, in Clarendon, in Buckingham, and in several other neighborhoods. I hope you feel inspired to advocate for the local places, people, and stories that matter to you and that make Arlington such a special place. And maybe I'll even see you here at Freddy's. We hope that you enjoyed that glimpse into Freddy's and can appreciate its cultural importance. And so now let's bring our attention back to Lily. In July of 2021, Bayer Blender Bell Architects and Planners approached our preservation program about partnering on a documentation project related to Arlington's LGBTQ heritage. We were eager to collaborate and decided to embark on a pilot project together to study the history and significance of an Arlington specific site. So now I will turn the presenta presentation over to Katie. Thank you, Cynthia. My firm, Byer Blinder Bell, and I personally have been incredibly grateful for the experience and opportunity to work with Cynthia and her team and participate in this documentation effort with Arlington County. 
Um, it's been so incredibly interesting and rewarding to learn about the LGBTQ history and the community um, through this project. After some initial conversations um, with Arlington County and with the Virginia SHPO, we enthusiastically started our research to identify LGBTQ plus sites that would be good candidates for a more detailed research study. Our first step was to familiarize ourselves with the existing online resources, especially several of the historic context statements that have been recently published, which provide excellent understanding of LGBTQ history themes. They discuss historical constructs of gender and sexuality um, and consider preservation specific topics. In 2019, um, the DC Historic Preservation Office released their context, sta context statement for DC's LGBTQ resources. Due to the proximity of DC and Arlington, many aspects of the DC context statement can be applied to Northern Virginia. DC was the regional epicenter of the LGBTQ plus community, and many of Arlington's residents likely socialized at the various LGBTQ friendly establishments in the city. That said, we cannot rely on the DC context statement fully and are still dedicated to learning about the LGBTQ plus experience that is specific to Arlington County. Preservation Maryland and the Maryland Historic Trust also published a historic context study um, in 2020, which provided um, some very helpful guidance and reiterated some of the challenges to be aware of when approaching LGBTQ plus history and preservation. For example, changing historic uh, constructs of gender and sexuality mean that people in the past understood their identities and desires in ways that are entirely different from how we understand ours today. This means that while we may glimpse motivations, actions, and desires in the historical record that resonate with our contemporary understandings, we will not find pre-20th century references that adhere precisely to our 21st century constructs. Explicit evidence of same-sex activity, let alone transgender um, or other LGBTQ plus identities, is extremely rare until the 20th century. For so long, the LGBTQ community has been relegated to the fringes of society, meaning that they have largely socialized and organized in secret, which can make it difficult to find their stories in historical records. Reliable archival material can be difficult to find and may require researcher, researchers to look at existing collections with a renewed perspective and focus on finding these out of sight narratives. In many cases, collecting oral histories is critical to bringing the long, long undervalued and overlooked stories to light. The National Park Service's extensive LGBTQ heritage theme study that was released in 2016 is also an excellent resource. It mentions many LGBTQ uh, histories and places across the country and includes, um, and includes an appendix that identifies all the locations that are mentioned in the text. So it's a great place to start for anyone who wants to complete um, similar research. Though Virginia does not have a historic context statement of its own, um, the SHPO has assembled a variety of research materials available on its website. Um, that include an LGBTQ uh, his timeline um, of history in Virginia and the U.S., um, a relevant uh, laws and legal cases, a list of LGBTQ uh, persons of Virgin from Virginia of note, and a list of Virginia places associated with LGBTQ heritage, although this did not include any places from Northern Virginia, let alone Arlington County. Several online resources, um, mapping resources, and archives were also helpful in our initial research. Historypin.org um, is a crowdsourced mapping website with a map um, of LGBTQ America, which pins a lot of the places um, that are mentioned in the historic context statements. Um, mapping the Gay Guides is a national endowment for the humanities funded uh, project that maps listing, listings from the Damron address books that date from 1965 to 1980. Started by businessman Bob Damron, the address books list um, uh, gay bars and public spaces that were friendly to gay men. They were in effect similar to the Green Book used by African Americans while traveling during the Jim Crow era. 
1965, only five locations in Virginia were listed, and none of them were in Northern Virginia. However, there were 14 listings in Washington, D.C., which reflects the social ties between our, those two locales. In 1975, the wooded area at the Iwo Jima Memorial was the first location listed in Arlington. It was known as a cruising location for gay men looking for anonymous sex. The guides used a code of letters um, and symbols to designate certain features of the listings. Um, D was used for dancing, OC for an older crowd, and B for blacks frequent. Hot meant sites that were dangerous um, and could be uh, raided by police. In 1978, the Dam Run book explicitly warned against cruising at the Iwo Jima Memorial, um, stating that there were, quote, murders, muggings, and arrests galore. End quote. We also found several online archival uh, resources um, that include the Rainbow History Project um, and the um, uh, GLBT Historical Society Museum and Archives that's based in San Francisco, but provides um, a great uh, online repository of information and collections. The Library of Congress also has an informative reading guide that offers information on on their LGBTQ plus related collections um, and is a good contact and provides good contextual information as well. So based on this initial research, we were able to identify a number of sites connected to individuals or events highlighting LGBTQ plus history. They included the residences of Dr. Lily um, Vincennes, a gay rights activist, Carl N. Rizzi, a well-known drag queen, and Jay Bizet, the first openly gay person elected to public office in Virginia. Freddy's, as you've seen in the video, was identified as a well-known gay bar in South Arlington. And there were also several properties that are already listed. However, their significance, um, as currently reported, is not derived from any connection to LGBTQ history. The Pentagon and Iwo Jima memorials uh, were scenes of pickets and demonstrations against the treatment of homosexuals, and the Unitarian Universalist Church of Arlington, constructed in 1963, and which actively supported the LGBTQ community since the 1970s, um, but it was listed um, solely for its modernist architectural significance and its connection to architect Charles Goodman. And so from this list, um, the residents of Lily Vin Vincennes stood out as an ideal candidate for further research. Vincennes was referenced in the DC um, contextual study, which noted that she had hosted the Gay Women's Open House at her home in Arlington for an extended period of time. A more detailed search uh, revealed that she was a very important figure in the homophile movement in DC in the 1960s and 70s and had important ties to other gay rights organizations across the country. In 2013, the Library of Congress acquired her collection of personal papers and other memorabilia, providing a wealth of archival information that was readily available uh, to us as we're based in DC. Furthermore, the Columbia Heights West neighborhood, where her residence is located in Arlington, had been recorded in a Virginia Shippo architectural survey for its association with the development of suburban neighborhoods for the growing working and middle-class communities in Arlington following World War II. Thus, there were many interesting angles to approach the study, and we were confident in the range of, of archival resources available, and we felt that, felt that the property stood a good chance of being National Register criteria. And so we delved into researching Lily Vincennes the Gay Women's Open House, and the history of development um, of the Columbia Heights uh, West neighborhood. Lily's collection at the Library of Congress, um, materials from the DC History Center, articles from The Blade, which was Was is Washington DC's LGBTQ newspaper, um, as well as uh, materials from um, the Arlington Land Records and archival material um, at, through, available through the Arlington Public Library um, were used in, in our in our research. We were also able to connect uh, for a phone conversation with Lily's friend, Bob uh, Wittick, who had memories of attending the open house on, um, on special friends nights um, on which, in which men could attend. 
Born in 1939 and raised in Germany and in, and in New Jersey, Lily first recognized her attraction to women in her late teens. In her early 20s, she struggled with depression and sought the help of a therapist. In 1962, after dropping out of her English PhD program at the university, at Columbia University, she enlisted in the Women's Army Corps as a neuropsychiatric technician. This reflected her interest, her growing interest in psychology, um, as well as her desire to meet other gay women in the service. She was posted to the Walter Reed uh, Army Medical Center in Washington, where she was introduced to the gay bar scene in DC. Not long after, in 1963, Vincennes was outed by her roommate and was honorably discharged. Lily wrote, quote, My reputation was sacrificed, but a heavy burden of hypocrisy had dropped from me as well. I decided to build another me, no longer dependent on the approval of others. End quote. Following her discharge from the army, Vincennes connected with the Mattachine Society of Washington, becoming its first lesbian member. Originally founded in Los Angeles in in Los Angeles in 1950, the Mattachine Society was a civil liberties and social action organization dedicated to improving the social status of homosexuals. It was part of the larger homophile movement throughout the United States, and the Washington chapter was founded in 1961 by Frank Kameny and Jack Nichols. Vincennes, Vincennes recalled that she had joined um, the Mattachine Society of Washington to, quote, be with gay people, help the movement, help unmask the lies being told about us, correct the notion of homosexuality as a sickness, and present it as it is, a beautiful way to love." End quote. In 1965, she joined the first pickets in DC, include, including those at the White House and at the Pentagon to protest the US government's treatment of homosexuals. At this time, she was also editor of the MSW's magazine, The Homosexual Citizen. Through her ties with MSW, Vincennes met lesbian activists and life partners, Barbara Giddings and Kay Lahusen, both of whom were involved with the Daughters of Bilitis, the first lesbian civil and political rights organization in the US, which was founded in 1955 in San Francisco by several lesbian couples, including Del Martin and Phyllis Lyne. In 1966, she was featured on the January cover of the Daughters of Bilitis magazine, The Ladder, which is a very uh, public expression and a big deal that reflected her self-assuredness and gay positive creed. Vincennes became an important spokesperson for the homophile movement, doing radio and television interviews to educate and familiarize the public with the gay community, refute commonly accepted fallacies about homosexuals, and made, make appeals um, for an end to prejudice and discrimination. As a nascent but passionate filmmaker, she was in Philadelphia to capture the third Reminder Day picket and in New York City uh, for the first Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade in 1970, which was organized to commemorate the first anniversary of the Stonewall Riots and served as New York City's uh, first Pride March. These films are also part of the Library of Congress collection and are available to watch online, which I highly recommend. In 1971, Frank Kameny, who had founded uh, the Mattachine Society of Washington, the MSW, entered the race uh, for DC's non-voting congressional delegate, and Vincennes helped with the campaign. Though Kameny finished fourth, it was a watershed moment and changed the perception of and political presence of the LGBT community in Washington, DC. Following the election, there were many calls from women um, to the MSW wanting to meet others, and Lily's was the only number available to give out. She quickly realized there was a need for a place where gay, bisexual, and women questioning their sexuality could meet in a comfortable and reassuring space. Thus, uh, Lily Vincent started the Gay Women's Open House and, stopped, and stepped away from her involvement in the Mattachine Society. While hosting the weekly open house, she began studying for a master's degree in psychology, graduating in 1976 from George Mason, and began her private practice in psychotherapy, working mostly with LGBTQ individuals and groups. One of the most significant efforts of 
the Mattachin Society was to publicly refute the American Psychiatric Association's designation of homosexuality as a mental disorder. In 1971, Vincennes participated in a panel discussion at the APA's annual meeting. Such, such panels eventually led the APA to remove this designation in 1973. During the 1980s, she and her life partner, Nancy Ruth Davis, set up a counseling group for people with AIDS at the Whitman Walker Clinic in DC. In 1990, she earned her PhD in human development and psychology from the University of Maryland, continuing her work as a psychotherapist. And in 1992, she and Nancy established the Community of Self-Development that hosted conferences and workshops dedicated to the creative, spiritual, and psychological fulfillment of gay women and men. Over the past two decades, Dr. Vincennes has been well recognized for her activism and contributions to the LGBTQ community. In 2009, she was honored as a superhero at Capital Pride, and in 2019, Dr. Vincent was inducted into the Association of LGBTQ Journalists Hall of Fame in recognition of her pathbreaking journalism and video journalism um, and gay rights activism during the 60s and 70s. Vincent has been a longtime resident of Arlington County and still lives in the region. Dr. Vincent's dedication to the LGBT community was manifested in many ways. However, one of her most significant contributions that was based in Arlington was the Gay Women's Open House. Vincennes moved to Arlington in 1969, renting a duplex in the Columbia Heights West neighborhood that was developed in 1950. On moving, she recounted, quote, I moved out of DC because rents were too high and because I absolutely needed a house with a yard with trees in it, end quote. The open house began in March, in, 19, in March of 1971 and was held every Wednesday as an alternative social environment to the gay bars in DC. Vincent said of the open house, quote, there is no agenda or discussion topic. The purpose is to provide companionship and the atmosphere is friendly, not cruisy. Some women who call have never dared to express their gay inclinations to anyone and are talking to a lesbian for the first time." End quote. Advertisements for the open house were placed in the Quicksilver Times as well as the Gay Blade, two of the LGBTQ newspapers in DC at the time. She also wrote to her friends and fellow activists to spread the word. While most attendees were from the Washington metro area, many drove from Baltimore and Annapolis, Maryland, um, from North of Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. The vast majority of open house attendees were white women in their 20s and 30s. But on occasion, uh, Calivia Carter, a black gay activist um, who co-founded the Langston Hughes and Eleanor Roosevelt Democratic Club, would also attend. Other times, groups such as the Furies and the Washington Feminists were, were also in attendance. Vincennes wrote, quote, Ideological differences don't seem to matter much in our group and sisterhood prevails. Whether you are a lesbian under 21 or over 50, whether you are a radical or reactionary, a dropout or a professional, a daughter or a mother, single or in a gay or straight marriage, you are welcome and invited to make yourself at home." End quote. The impact of the Gay Women's Open House on the lives of hundreds of women is best captured in the personal stories, as well as the letters and cards that Vincennes received over the years. One reads, Lily, I wish I had known a place like yours, your open house 15 years ago, when I first became aware of my gay feelings. Back then, I didn't have the courage nor the knowledge of what to do with them. I admire you, Lily, more than anyone I know. I admire you because you're so natural about being gay, because you dare to be free and open to be who you are. The last open house at Lily's was hosted um, on January 31st, 1979. This was a personal dedication to stop, or personal decision to stop hosting, but also reflected the greater number of social alternatives that existed for women then at the, by that time. Um, however, the open house format inspired other similar gatherings. 
The DC Now Sexuality Task Force held open houses on Tuesday evenings at the Arlington Unitarian Church for a period of time. And from 1980 to 1993, they gave women's alternative, um, which initially started in New York, um, inspired by Lily's open house and eventually came to DC, um, provided another relaxed, non-threatening atmosphere at the Washington Ethical Society in DC, impacting still hundreds more women and continuing the legacy of Lily's open house. And so based on our research and findings and with the knowledge of the gay rights movement through the noted content statements, we determined that Lily's Arlington residence meets National Register criteria A and B. It is a site that is associated with a pattern of events, the Gay Women's Open House, which made a significant contribution to the development of a lesbian community in Arlington and the wider DC area. It also is associated with Dr. Lily Vincennes, who was significant within the national homophile movement of the 60s and 70s. Furthermore, the property is directly representative of her historic contributions. The property retains integrity, uh, though aspects related to its design um, have, uh, have been impacted to a certain degree by recent alterations. As you can see um, in my background, which is an image of the residence, um, uh, the site, siding has been added to the original concrete uh, masonry walls and the windows have also been replaced but it does maintain um, a, a large expression of its original design and aspects of location, setting, and association remain strong. As preservationists in the United States, the National Register um, criteria remains the foremost framework used to assess significance of heritage sites. Listing on the National Register has many benefits, including national recognition, the eligibility for uh, historic tax credits, um, and uh, consideration in federal projects uh, through the Section 106 process. Increasing the number of LGBTQ plus properties included on the National Register is an important goal, and the register should be used as a tool to ensure such stories are represented um, as part of our national historic narrative. However, there are inherent limitations of using the National Register to recognize LGBTQ plus sto stories. The National Register is a place-based preservation framework that favors longevity and permanent physical imprints, qualities that are not always possible considering the ephemeral and underground nature of many places and events tied to LGBTQ plus stories. Requirements for integrity pose another limitation, especially those relating to design, materials, and workmanship, qualities that are unlikely to be retained at sites associated with marginalized, marginalized and underrepresented communities that frequently experience gentrification, removal, and redevelopment. Additionally, these qualities, while important for properties of architectural significance, may not be as relevant to properties nominated for their significance to cultural heritage and, his, and social history. There are many instances where social and cultural significance is spread across multiple locations. Annie's Paramount Steakhouse in Washington, D.C. is an interesting example of a property that has been recently listed in the D.C. inventory um, and has been nominated to the National Register. It is significant as one of the earliest LGBTQ friendly establishments in the district. The two different locations of the restaurant over time meant that the nomination covers two non-contiguous properties under a single landmark nomination. However, this didn't impact things um, and the Washington Blade, uh, DC's current uh, LGBTQ uh, newspaper said it best, quote, the Paramount has become an institution in the gay community there was never much concern about history being left behind when the Paramount moved to its new place. It's people who make history." End quote. In our research, we have to be aware that in many cases, places of importance to the LGBTQ plus community may already be listed. However, their connections to those histories has not been realized or has been overlooked and or omitted. omitted. In Arlington, there were several properties where this was the case. For, 
um, for a list of properties that are recognized for their architectural or other historic significance. Um, it is important to broaden the documented narratives to include LGBTQ plus stories. Historic districts are traditionally recognized for architectural significance and or historical association with the development of a certain locality, and they're prone to ignore social histories. I believe it's still the case that to date, no historic district is recognized for its social significance to the LGBTQ BTQ plus community. Many existing districts, including Greenwich Village and other so-called neighborhoods in cities across the U.S., have long been recognized for their significant connections to the development of LGBTQ plus communities, yet this isn't yet reflected in their National Register documentation. There are also many instances of individual property nominations associated with important individuals that omit reference to their sexual or sexual or gender nonconformity. Now that these topics are more commonly discussed, it is important that we revisit and reflect on the existing narratives and embrace the full complexity and histories of the people who are recognized at those historic sites. William Murtaugh was the first keeper of the National Register of Historic Places, and he wrote, quote, at its best, preservation engages the past in a conversation with the present over a mutual connection for the future, end quote, which I think is a beautiful statement and especially important to consider. So when looking to research and recognize LGBTQ plus history, a good starting point may be to revisit already listed properties with a renewed perspective. We'd like to end with some final points on research and lessons learned and discuss some of our next steps as Arlington continues to research and recognize the LGBTQ plus history in the county. Firstly, we found it very helpful to start our process with conversations with the SHPO um, to understand common goals, to discuss existing resources, and just be made aware of other localities, groups, and individuals with similar initiatives. There is an ever-growing number of books, content statements, articles, theses, online videos, recorded panel discussions, podcasts, um, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> discussing LGBTQ plus history and preservation. While we mostly relied on the context statements uh, previously discussed, um, other archival material and other ar archival materials, we also wanted to acknowledge um, some additional resources that we used, including the dismantled preservation panel discussion um, that's entitled Queering Preservation, Multidisciplinary Approaches to Telling LGBTQ Stories, which is available on YouTube. Um, and the National Trust, Trust's online leadership forum page um, entitled Preservation and, and Inclusion, which offers a lot of articles um, on interpretation and storytelling, community engagement, and social justice that we will continue to read and reference. Um, as we continue um, with our project in Arlington. There's so much inspiring and thought-provoking work that's being done, um, and it's really exciting to be a part of that. A major component of our project that is still forthcoming will involve engagement with the local LGBTQ plus community to ask them to share their stories and experiences. Recognizing the personal and intimate nature of the information and stories we are seeking it is paramount that we are sensitive, patient, open, and honest, working to build trust while emphasizing that these stories matter. While combing through information in existing archives and online is a great place to start and often leads to further investigation, so much of LGBTQ plus heritage relies on collecting oral histories and personal stories. Targeted outreach to prominent groups and members of the community who are trusted and who can offer advice and support will be very important in this next step. Another aspect for us to be aware of is intersectionality, recognizing that there is not just one universal LGBTQ community or experience. Our future outreach and interpretation must consider the racial, gender, class, and generational diversity amongst different LGBTQ identities. 
it is important to be aware to be aware of unconsciously favoring gay and lesbian stories, for example, whereas bisexual and transgender stories may be more difficult to find. We likewise encourage that documentation projects present all historical evidence rather than shying away from uncertainty, even where ambiguity may be present. Also, understanding that ideas about sexuality and gender have changed over time, as have prejudices against LGBTQ identities, it is necessary to be sensitive to the vocabulary that is being used and then to make explanations and clarifications where appropriate. Looking ahead, Arlington will continue to examine its listed and documented historic sites through a lens of diversity. This will allow us to build on the traditional known narratives by considering and incorporating LGBTQ plus experiences and history. While there is indeed value to documenting and interpreting sites in traditional ways, such as through National Register nominations and historical highway markers, we also encourage the exploration of other creative and impactful ways to tell cultural stories. We see the benefits of producing more cultural spotlight videos, like the one for Freddie's Beach Bar that we've shared with you, and other digital tools such as memory mapping, where community members are encouraged to tell stories about particular places, even if those places no longer exist physically. But th this allows memories to be read and interpreted topographically, thereby creating new potential digital spaces for LGBTQ plus stories and social histories to be recorded. A great example of this is the GLBT Historical Society's virtual tour of the home of lesbian activists Del Martin and Phyllis Lyon in San Francisco. Their house was digitally documented and then interwoven with the narrative of their lives, their activism, and the use of the space. So in conclusion, thank you so much for listening to our presentation. We hope you have learned some helpful research resources and techniques, and that you will consider some of the preservation challenges and opportunities for recognizing LGBTQ plus heritage. We hope that you now feel inspired to delve into LGBTQ plus history and preservation efforts in your own communities. We think you'll be amazed at what you discover. We've certainly been inspired by Dr. Lily Vincennes and the work of so many others across the country. We are excited to continue to learn about, preserve, and celebrate LGBTQ plus stories in history. Thank you.